Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be shortly beginning this webinar. Still see people entering the meeting room. Good afternoon. Welcome to our World Health Assembly virtual side event, taking stock of CTEP, lessons learned for future pandemic preparedness and response. My name is Ella Wegen and I'm a senior global health advocate at WEMOS and I will be moderating this session. For everyone to be aware, we will record this session and put it online for future use. WEMOS is the pen holder of a consortium called COVID Innovation for All, which consists of Knowledge Ecology International, Health Action International, Pharmaceutical Accountabil Accountability Foundation, Cooperation Innovarte, Medicines Law and Policy, and WEMOS. WEMOS recently launched a website, covid19response.org, to give a review of initiatives for access to COVID-19 innovation. CTEP is one of them. In May 2020, CTEP was launched by the WHO in partnership with the government of Costa Rica under a global solidarity call endorsed by over 40 member states. The purpose of CTEP is to provide a platform for developers of COVID-19 health products to voluntarily share their intellectual property, knowledge and data with multiple quality assured manufacturers. This would enable manufacturers that currently have untapped capacity to produce COVID-19 health technologies by giving them the legal rights to manufacture and sell the products, the technical know-how required to develop high quality products and access to clinical data needed to obtain regulatory approval for their products. CTEP works through its implementing partners, the Medicines Patent Pool, Open COVID-19 Pledge, UN Technology Bank and UNITE, who facilitate timely, equitable and affordable access to COVID-19 health technologies. Developers of COVID-19 health technologies and holders of related knowledge, IP and data are invited to voluntarily share with CTEP and join the solidarity call to action. Since its establishment, there have been two successful technology transfer agreements. One with the Spanish National Research Council, CSIC, for a COVID-19 serological antibody technology. We will get a presentation today of the CSIC. Last minute, the agenda was modified to include this interesting speaker. And the second agreement of CTEP was made public last week. We got the news from President Biden that the US National Institute of Health offers 11 COVID-19 technologies for the development of several innovative therapeutics, early stage vaccines and diagnostic tools for COVID-19. There is hope for an even wider technology sharing by IP holders with CTEP for improving global access to innovations for current and future pandemics. The purpose of this event is to take stock of CTEP's impact to date with a view of sharing and reflecting on the factors influencing the technology transfer agreements good practices, challenges, challenges, and lessons learned for the future. Diverse stakeholders will share their experience, insights, and recommendations for CTEP and future technology sharing mechanisms as part of global pandemic preparedness and response. An overview of the agenda you can see on the screen now. It's a full agenda and therefore I will be strictly man managing the time. The hashtags of today Today's event are CTEP, hashtag CTEP, and hashtag WHA75. We will start with one of the founders of CTEP, the former head of social security from Costa Rica, Mr. Roman Macaya. I would like to ask you the following question. Why did Costa Rica start with CTEP? And could you take stock of today and give recommendations for the future? You have five minutes and I will indicate when you have one minute left. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And it's a pleasure to be on this panel today to take stock of how well has uh, CTAP worked. Um, I'll start off with the basics. Uh, this pandemic crisis created a logistics crisis. The acquisition of personal protective equipment, of durable equipment such as mechanical ventilators, of test kits for diagnostics, of therapeutics, and of vaccines for prevention, all experienced some uh, issues, whether they were slow deliveries, delays in deliveries, cancellation of orders, uh, increase in costs, and uh, sometimes even uh, simply products that were not introduced into the Costa Rican market. It was a big issue that uh, the whole world 
synchronized its demand for these products, buying the same products from the same uh, suppliers at the same time. And this created a, a tremendous uh, problem. So I, I'd like to start out by saying that Costa Rica had the resources uh, to address this pandemic in terms of financial resources, infrastructure, human resources, but we needed the supply. We had um, the emergency protocols that had been well established much prior to this pandemic. We had a contingency fund that has been used in other occasions and was used in this occasion as well. Uh, we have a vaccination and epidemiology commission that uh, defines what vaccine should be purchased, um, which is the target population, how many doses should be acquired, what is the mechanism of the acquisition of these uh, vaccines, which in our case was direct purchases from some manufacturers and then through the COVAX uh, mechanism. Um, all the different um, assets that have to be brought together to, to make this a reality and the strategy for vaccination. This is an inter-institutional inter effort that involves the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Foreign Relations and Worship, the Ministry of Finance, the National Emergency Commission, the Costa Rican Social Security, and the Ministry of Planning. And with all of this, uh, we defined that basket of vaccines that we were to purchase. Now, um, this is something that we faced that was unusual in that we had to purchase something that did not exist yet. In other words, we had to make commitments to acquire uh, vaccines before they were available uh, and before they were approved by, uh, by the regulatory authorities. This is something that had never been done and it's very complicated to do this using public funds. So that was one of the issues that came into play. But I'd like to address the question that our moderator has posed and why CTEP? Why did Costa Rica propose CPAP? And uh, I, you know, I, I made that summary uh, prior to this question in to state that Costa Rica had the financial and infrastructure and human resources. So even though cost is an issue, supply was more important than cost. And so CTAP was uh, a, a voluntary mechanism, as we all know, to pool IP assets to address a global crisis. Now, uh, CTAP uh, was to make supply more available and more equitably distributed. And that's a very important issue in, in global terms, the, the equity in this. And so um, we've seen some encouraging momentum with uh, many countries supporting the initiative, uh, NIH coming on board, the Spanish Research Council coming on board, uh, the medicines patent pool uh, coming into play. But um, thinking about the next pandemic, uh, if we look back over the last 20 years, we've had uh, three coronaviruses. And so there's a good chance that we'll, there will be another one in the next decade. So how can we use technologies, sometimes as specific as coronavirus related technologies to prepare for the next pandemic? Can we use surveillance uh, with CTAP technology and information to be better prepared? Can we prepare a universal coronavirus therapy or a vaccine that will be more available, that will be available much faster in the next pandemic than this one, because a lot of the technology's proof of concept has been established. So I'd just like to end by saying that CTAP, um, with the uh, administration of the MPP for negotiations, might have to be also uh, pulled together with prize incentive pools to uh, bring players into the fold, uh, given that this is a voluntary program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Roman Macaya from Costa Rica. Our next speaker is Mrs. Erika Duenas Loiza, head of the Intellectual Property Unit at the WHO Division for Access to Medicines and Health Products. She will give an overview of the work of CTEP, about agreements concluded, agreements in process, and ambitions for the future. 
you have 10 minutes and one minute before the end, I will give a sign. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? I had some connectivity problems. Okay. No. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Ella and, and to the organizers for inviting us to, to participate in, in, in this important event and also for organizing this important discussion uh, around CTAP because that, that helped uh, uh, help us uh, in the work we're, we're doing. So uh, my objective, and, and thank you because I think most of you know already CTAP, I don't need to, to go to explanations, you also introduced the, the mechanism. So I'm going to focus more on, the, on, on giving you a, a quick update on, on where we are, not only in the engagement uh, with the technology holders, as you mentioned, but, but in the, in the, um, and a quick update on the, on the main pillars of our uh, working plan uh, for these two years, 2021 and 2022. So, um, of course, the, the, the focus and the, the, the priority was the engagement with technology holders. And as you uh, have mentioned, um, and, and we have CSIC as, as another speaker, the, the Spanish Research Institute, so I'm not going to focus too much on the... <clears throat> On that, but we uh, signed this first license with the um, with the Spanish Research Council, Research Council, and we are um, now in, in the process of negotiating a sub licensing uh, agreement with a potential uh, interesting uh, interested technology uh, a manufacturer in, in a developing country, which will close the 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 the, the, the process like uh, since the beginning until the end of the of the mechanism so um, we we have other offers uh, of course from other manufacturers uh, uh, the Spanish research Institute is uh, has also offered another vaccines and we're in negotiations I'm sorry because we, I cannot share details of other negotiations because we are under confidentiality uh, clauses for the negotiations. But um, uh, for you to know that uh, we are in, uh, in discussions with other vaccines manufacturers, we are in discussions with other uh, technology holders that have uh, diagnostics. We have also um, prioritized uh, for diagnostics, we have prioritized our requests to technology holders that are producing rapid tests that are um, demanded. Um, and, and we have prioritized as well from an assessment of the medical devices needed and we are getting in touch with the um, technology holders uh, in the field of medical devices, other medical devices. So this is basically in relation to the engagement with the technology holders. Then we have also an, a very important pillar <clears throat> that uh, um, we would like to, to share with you some thoughts is about the, uh, this paper we are preparing, another discussion paper in relation to access provisions in funding agreements. We believe that that is a very um, important call that comes from the solidarity call to action uh, as well uh, to, to request the, the funders to include some uh, of these provisions uh, in, in these agreements. Um, we realized that there are very few examples. We were trying to collect some, some examples. And, that uh, and it, it was very difficult to find, but we organized some me consultations and meetings with experts in order to um, make some recommendations. So we are planning to present just after the assembly um, in, a, in a webinar, uh, this paper and these recommendations. Uh, and this work, of course, is also complementary to the work that uh, that is being done by other organizations like UNDP um, uh, in this project, uh, un uh, Uniting Efforts, I think it's the name of the project, uh, on access policies as well. But we are more focused on, on specific provisions that should be included in this kind of funding agreements. So that's another key pillar. Um, then we have, uh, of course, this discussion um, in relation to incentives. We are, uh, we, we really think that we, 
um, need to move forward in these discussions. That is why we launch a, a questionnaire to member states um, uh, to tell them uh, what kind of incentives they are, are ready to they are already give, uh, giving or, or they are ready to give to the technology holders to facilitate the sharing link to the to the sharing through CETA. So as uh, as um, uh, Roman just mentioned, uh, one uh, one option, one possibility are not are these um, financial incentives. So what what you mentioned uh, about price incentives pool, uh, for link to the sharing, for example, and uh, and all these. Um, different uh, possibilities like regulatory incentives, tariffs are, uh, are being discussed among member states. So we are also planning to uh, an event with member states and the, the co-sponsors are very active as well in relation to that in order to continue this discussion and to see um, how we can facilitate. We um, are also um, uh, working on the on the regulatory side for that, uh, but of course what we have uh, identified uh, uh, in the questionnaires and in other information is that there, there is a lot of, of um, regulatory incentives that member states are already uh, um, given to the to the developers. So um, this is another important uh, uh, work, and another important pillar is this. Uh, that we are going to launch very soon is the, the global CTAP database, um, including a, a information uh, as, a, as a tool for, for our negotiations, but also for the, um, the other, other stakeholders that are interested in. Um, we are including information about a list of specific products that we have prioritized for, for our work in CTAP. Um, including vaccines, uh, medical devices, diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, and for the, that specific list of products, we are uh, trying to compile as much as information uh, um, as, as it is possible. Uh, of course, publicly available information in relation to um, the clinical trials linked to these products. The uh, publications, um, scientific publications related to this um, to these products. Of course, the patent and, and licensing information that must come from the, from uh, the medicines patent pool, the, the MedSpal and the VaxPal databases. Uh, but we are also trying to list the manufacturers, the, the regulatory information for this product and for that we not only at the global level but we also launch a, a questionnaire a survey to uh, member states in relation to um, if about this list of products if they can provide additional information not only patent information but also uh, um, if the product has been uh, approved in their countries etc so this will be a very uh, important tool and we are very happy to to launch it uh, very soon and then uh, maybe to finalize just a comment on the the costa rica uh, work as uh, um, here in Geneva, uh, uh, taking the leadership uh, of this group of co-sponsors and organizing several uh, meetings with the co-sponsors uh, in, order, in order to um, find ways among themselves on how they can help us with the engagement with the technology holders. And we thank Costa Rica for, for those efforts. Uh, of course, we um, we started with the with the some of the um, co-sponsors, member states co-sponsors, uh, because they also uh, facilitated some meetings uh, with their own public research institute, which was very useful. And the good example, of course, is is Spain because they um, uh, they have already shared the first license to CETA. But in the same way, we are engaging in uh, with other uh, public health institutes and, and uh, other technology holders. Uh, that have been facilitated, the discussions facilitated by um, 
the member states. So I think I'm going to stop here and then I'm very happy to answer uh, additional questions in relation to to CTAP and the, and the work we're doing now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Duenas Loiza from the World Health Organization. Uh, right on time, I have to say. Uh, our next speaker is the head of the of, head of policy of the medicines patent pool, Mr. Esteban Burone. He will talk about licensing COVID-19 technologies for innovation and access. Several questions I have for you, Mr. Burone, about the NIH agreement. How did the agreement with the NIH came into being and how can this be organized earlier in future pandemic response? What is the importance of the NIH license agreement? You have 10 minutes as well. And I will give you a sign one, in, one minute before. Yes. Sure. Um, thank you so much, Elan. Thank you for uh, for inviting me and for, for the question. So in terms of um, how did this come about? Um, I think the first point, of course, is um, NIH is not just a, um, an important public research organization, but has one that has significant innovation, innovation capacity and has been throughout the pandemic extremely active in undertaking a lot of research and research applied across the board to diagnostics, treatment and vaccines. So that's the first point to bear in mind. Uh, of course, to, to transfer the technology, you need to have a strong technology and innovation base. Um, second point I would say is that um, we had a, a strong um, uh, collaboration and partnership that dated back uh, several years uh, with the NIH, which had been the first organization to, to license to the medicines patent pool. And that provided a good um, basis, a precedent, and, and also um, comfort in, in as we were approaching this, this whole process. Um, I think the third point is uh, around political leadership. Uh, I think we need to um, be very aware of that and the importance of having taken the decision to really uh, try and do things differently. Um, the patents that have been licensed to CTAP are patents owned by the US government. Um, and therefore, it's very much, I guess, a decision at, at, at high levels within the government to really um, try and do things different and, and, and see if, if it can overcome some of the challenges that we face throughout the, the, the pandemic uh, to date. Um, and I'd like to, to just maybe add one other point is that when we were interacting, of course, with the NIH, we, we were aware of certain patents or certain technologies that could be particularly interesting um, <clears throat> to license in. But it was very much an effort of NIH institutes as a whole, uh, which is, as you know, not, not just one institute, but a whole uh, a network of different institutes, each one of them looking at the various technologies they had been developing and those that they could make available through CTAP. So it was, you know, very much went beyond what, you know, our, our, our originally, original ask might have been. And that was, again, the result of that strong leadership and support. Now, why, why is it important? Why is the NIH uh, licenses, um, uh, why, why are they important? Um, I think there's, there's two levels here. I mean, there's, a, there's the practical level, which is um, <clears throat> it could uh, enable product developers to, to access important technology um, to further innovation and to, and, and to you know, take that, that, that in, uh, into, into a further development process that may result in products down the road. I mean, these are all early stage technologies. Um, it's likely that you know, some of them will never be taken forward. That's, we know how that, that works. There are high attrition rates in R&D. Um, and some of them may not work, of course, while, uh, when, when they're taken into preclinical clinical uh, studies. But it's also possible that one of them may become the next game changer in the COVID-19 response, or could be critical in the fight, in the fight against another coronavirus or another pathogen. Uh, and and the, as, 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 as was mentioned, these are technologies and, and, and patents, and in some cases not patents, but you know, biological materials that are being shared um, that are relevant uh, for vaccine development. Uh, some are actual vaccine candidates, some are tools, some are diagnostics, some are um, uh, potential treatments, etc. So that's kind of on a, on a, on a practical level, why, you know, what can these licenses do? But then there is the broader perspective. And if we zoom out a bit, I think that's where you can really also see a you know, major breakthrough. When, when the world's largest health research organization signals it is willing to operate differently and, and make a whole range of technologies available to the world for licensing, it is sending, I think, a very strong message on how things could be done differently. And, and some may say it comes too late for this pandemic. Others will say, we'll see this as a major significant and, and, and it has 
that you can have for this one, but also for, for future, for future pandemics. So I think these are kind of the two levels in which I would like to think about it. Now, um, and around how this could be done and organized uh, differently and preferably earlier in, the, in future pandemic response, um, I think there are different ways to, to think about, about this question. I think that um, when we went into this pandemic over two years ago, and, and yes, it is already uh, over two years ago, um, there was unfortunately a perception uh, from a lot of stakeholders that you know, we had a, a public health licensing mechanism that had been active for over a decade and that had delivered important results. But there was this perception that, um, that the model could only really work to achieve affordable access in LMICs to already developed uh, products and in particular already developed small molecule medicines. And I think that led to a lot of uh, missed opportunities. Um, I mean, for sure, licensing on public health terms and conditions can play a critical role to facilitate um, affordable access to small molecules. And you know, we've seen that in HIV and viral hepatitis, and, and now we've seen that in the context of the COVID-19 antivirals. Um, but there is no reason why it should only be used for approved small molecules. And, and during COVID-19, we have seen many examples, um, maybe probably not as many as we would want to see, um, of licensing. And license is often combined within a broader technology transfer agreement on vaccines, on diagnostics, and on other health technologies. And I think licensing is ultimately about sharing IP, but also about sharing technology, know-how, uh, biological materials, as we mentioned earlier, uh, knowledge, and can also facilitate further innovation. So it need not be necessarily on the finished product. It could be on something that's still on technology, on, on research tools, on uh, another technology that could be used for further innovation, uh, combine, to combine with other technologies, to improve on that initial technology that was um, develop to adapt to specific needs and to take it through clinical trials and take it all the way to, to market authorization. Um, at least one of the technologies that were licensed by the NIH to CTAP uh, has already been licensed to several developers and, and has been incorporating some of the vaccines that are either approved or under development. Um, the technology itself is not a small molecule uh, and it's not an approved product, but by licensing, NIH is enabling others to innovate further. And some of those licensees have uh, taken it further into products. And, but if the objective is to address a public health problem, which is clearly what this was, you want to see licenses that are negotiated with a clear public health goal in mind. Licenses that are open, that are transparent, and that really put public health at the center of what you're trying to achieve through that license. Um, so coming back to your question on, on how this can be done differently, I, th I think we need to draw lessons uh, from this pandemic. I think it's interesting that public research organizations have been the first ones to come on board with with an initiative like CTAP um, and, 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 and this should contribute to you know practices evolving I think NIH uh, and, 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 the, and the CSIC are, are organizations that are to be commended for taking that step but I think they're also trying to by, by doing that they're also in a sense calling on others to 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 to, to do the same and to, and to take a similar approach so we want to see this evolving. But we also need to be thinking about all the, you know, the public funding that went into supporting research and product development and how to better leverage that public funding to support affordable access in, in LMICs and also to facilitate, broad, facilitate broader uh, innovation. And maybe the last point I want to make is um, we have another possibility that we should be exploring here, I think, further. I, mean, I think most of us would probably agree that one of the biggest failures in this pandemic has been the and has contributed to the to the inequity in access to health technologies has been the the slowness um, to to bring in manufacturers um, from across the world located in different different locations and different regions um, some of them with the capacity or some of them that could develop that capacity to really contribute to addressing uh, some of the supply constraints that roman was mentioning in his intervention um, and I, but i think in the last few months what we have collectively been putting in place is, is two really interesting networks that could be leveraged next time. And, and one of them is, is the network of manufacturers that are working on the COVID-19 antivirals. And there's you know, over 30 companies across, the, uh, across uh, uh, different regions that are now working on developing um, generic versions of the, of, of the two antivirals that have been developed and, uh, by Merck and Pfizer respectively and are you know, bringing them to market hopefully very soon. Um, and then we also have on the vaccine front, uh, there is the, the, the MRA technology transfer hub program that has been co-led by, by WHO and, uh, and MPP and, and, and with a whole range of partners and with 
with spokes based in 15 different countries. And where that's also about training the capacity and, 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 uh, and developing that capacity so that when we get to that next pandemic and the new products are being developed, we don't hear that, oh, but there's a lack of capacity. Uh, there will be, and we do have, now have two you know, networks that are ready to go and where hopefully licensing can happen sooner, faster, and as, as products um, are being developed, preferably as has happened in the context of the two antivirals, before the products were even approved, already working on the, on the licensing and the tech transfer in order right. to speed up access. So all I want to say is, is that I, I think that, that um, you know, not making use of, of, of that and not really thinking ahead on how we might do that, um, you know, the sharing earlier, the transferring of technology, the licensing across the different health technologies sooner. Uh, and I think now we have more examples of where, it, where it's working, where we can show that things are happening. Uh, and, and therefore, it be, it, 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 we, we may not have that same perception as we go into possible future pandemic, but even as we work further on, on this one, that, oh, this can only work in very, very specific circumstances. No, these mechanisms can work beyond. Licensing is critical to facilitate further innovation and access, and we can do this, uh, I think, um, uh, differently. So I don't. I, I want to stop there and, and thank you very much, Ella, for the opportunity to say a few words. I'm looking forward to any questions that may come from the audience. Thank you very much, uh, Esteban. There was one question. I think you can sure briefly answer. In the but let's. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for discussion. I'm afraid. But the question is by Brooke Baker, is the MPP negotiating with the US with respect to the Walter Reed Hospital COVID vaccine candidate? What can supporters do to help MPP or CTEP to license this candidate? Oh, you're on mute. Unfortunately, I usually can't talk about specific negotiations that are going on for the same reasons that, that Erica uh, has mentioned. But I do want to say that, you know, when there are opportunities, ourselves of WHO have been reaching out to to different um, uh, technology holders to explore possibilities of licensing. And, and if there are, of course, uh, suggestions from, from people in the audience of technologies that would be interesting to explore this kind of approach, we'd be happy to, to, to explore that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Esteban, from the Medicines Patent Pool. Uh, our next speaker is a representative of the Ministry of Health of Chile, Philip Vera because unfortunately, Mr. Cristobal Cuadrado, the Vice Minister of Health, who, uh, is not able yet to participate uh, now due to circumstances, but he might join later this event. Um, we still have uh, some questions uh, that the Minister of Health of uh, Chile can answer uh, about the importance of a good model to foster technology transfer. And my questions are, what is the value of CTEP initiative for a country like Chile? And what would you like to see in CTEP? And what incentives could uh, countries adopt to increase the support and use of CTEP? Mr. Hi. Philip Vera. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me properly? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay, cool. Uh, well, first of all, I, on behalf of the Subsecretary of Health of the Ministry, I'm very sorry. Uh, we have a, a little problem right now. So he's currently outside the Ministry. Uh, but uh, I'm here, I'm part of the cabinet, and we're currently working with him, you know, that is licensing and health technology assessment technologies, health technologies in general, right? So thank you for having us. Uh, for us as a Latin American country, this, this is a really good opportunity. We, we really think that CDOPS adds an important value and help us to develop in licensing and production. So in the first question, uh, I think that we need to really realize that Chile, like other countries in the region of, of the America, is in a real situation of dependency regarding the production in general of health technologies, which is not directly related to its productive capacities. That is to say, Chile has the economic resource and the capacities to advance in the production of medicine and other technologies. A condition that there is a relaxation of aspects such as, such as intellectual property rights or other technical knowledge related to the development and manufacture of means of diagnosis, devices, drugs, or vaccine. In the context of the pandemic, the world has advanced in in its understanding 
and there's currently more producing agents that must be generated in order to have a better supply of the needs of production. And obviously to attend this type of emergency, we need to open up our minds and have a change in the type of production that we are having in Western America, especially here in Chile. So that says the value of the CDAP lies in the offering of a space for the development of local capacities which in turn contribute to the local and global well-being progress and is clearly help us in reducing the dependency in the in the production offshore and to the extent to the extent that that agreement in general in general between countries economies of scale can be achieved that could be benefit to this CTAP regional in scope so the, so for the other questions what would you like to see in CDAPs? So what would <laughs> would like to see in CDAPs? We will, we would like to see a particip participation of the set of the different uh, related actors, such as the academy, and especially the public and private sector. The health sector must take advantage advantage of the leadership and agenda spaces to conduct an intersectoral agenda that, at the end, would allow. Uh, uh, the institutionalization and sustainability of the work among all these actors. So bringing help to all these actors and sectors. We're here in Chile, we're having um, a more flexible and a more correlated work with the private sector, the health sector and the academy. And we were looking forward to, to have a stronger bond and, and have a more correlated work in general. So, Finally, so about the incentives, I think that uh, there's a great number of incentives that we're looking for, and I, I'm going to mention some of them that could be of the highest importance. I think that the tax incentive is, is really something to look at. The access to tax benefits, such as the reduction or exemption from taxes on the direct effective income, with respect to the direct loss resources and our contract to third parties. This is thinking for the pr promotion and improvement of R&D in the, the uh, licensed technologies via CITA. Another incentive for us is the re regulatory incentive. So simplify the procedures and or administrative requir requirements for health and or emergency authorization for the commercialization of technologies, technologies licenses through CTAP, including the requirement for clinical studies of safety and effect, efficacy in the local population. Obviously, maintaining an adequate standard of, for the citizen, but uh, thinking, uh, thinking, <clears throat> taking in consideration this type of incentives, incentive could be really um, something that we will look forward to. Uh, another one is the incentive for the simplification of administrative products and procedures of intellectual property. Um, simplifying and speed up the administrative process and procedure, procedures, including the exemption of government, government fees for obtaining or maintaining intellectual property rights, license annotation or other documents related to technologies licensed through CTAP before the corresponding national authorities. Uh, so we also been thinking about the market stability incentives. So give preference to technology licenses through CTAP in the process of allocations funds and public subsidies to entrepreneurship and innovation and the binding for public purchases among others. The incentive to an observance of third party rights. So in this case, we're thinking about the limit compensation amount for infringement of third party intellectual property rights that only occur in good faith in the course of developing a technology provided to CITA. And finally, uh, one of the, I think more important that, that we need to think about here in Chile and for the future of Latin America is the network and human capital incentive. So, to think in forming a public-private support network to facilitate mentoring, training, 
and networking activities will allow taking advantage of the exchange of technical knowledge among peers among and the formation of possible commercial commercial alliances. So you see, we here really think that we we have like a broad spec that we can take, and we're really looking forward to having this space uh, to bring a more solid solid contribution here in Chile and especially in the Latin America sector. So thank you, Ella, for the space and thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Philippe Vera, for your presentation. It was very interesting indeed. Um, now we look at CTEP from uh, the Spanish perspective for the next speaker uh, that was just uh, last night added to the list of very interesting speakers. Uh, Mr. Jesus Marco, the Vice President for Science and Technology at the Spanish National Research Council, CSIC, the Spanish Public Research Institute that was the first to share with CTEP. Uh, I'm curious to hear about the process around their decision to share with CTEP. Why did CSIC decide to share their serological antibody with CTEP? Also for you, you have 10 minutes and I'll indicate when your presentation is one minute uh, oh, uh, don't due. Many thanks. Good afternoon. Many thanks to Wimos Foundation, to Knowledge Ecology International, and to Medicines uh, Law and Policy, and also to Salud for Derecho for organizing this event. I'm learning a lot from the previous speakers. I'm really happy to be here also, even in the last minute. And well, the question, if the question is why we decided to share the technology with the CITAP initiative, the answer it's very simple. How could we miss this opportunity? Eh? And in one word, uh, Erika said before, solidarity. Eh? Solidarity was the key message that flowed in all our researchers when the pandemic came. In just a few, a few days, more than 300 research groups in the National Research Council organized to work on all kinds of potential solutions for the pandemic not only as this um, solution for the serological test, also for antivirals, for vaccines that are yet being worked on, also for diagnostic kits, and everybody had the same spirit, eh? solidarity. Uh, of course, it was first solidarity, let's say, at national level, but very soon it was uh, not only because this is a global problem, also because it is solidarity at the most basic uh, sense. Eh? And this triggered a lot of effort from many people. And in particular, when we had the first results with this uh, serological test, uh, our technology transfer unit that was also very well connected internationally and that had the contact also with WHO uh, a few months later, but already had in mind that uh, when we were, after patenting the, the solution, when we were licensing this uh, solution, we had to keep it open so it could be then linked to other initiatives like this one, the CTAP, that uh, we learn later and that we thank a lot uh, to WHO and to Costa Rica government for this initiative that for us, it, it means a lot. Eh? And it means a lot because, as I said, it's not only the, the impact it has on, on let's say, on the, uh, the fact that the solution reaches really more people, it's also the fact that the researchers are uh, feel that they are part of the solution and they work and work very enthusiastically for the solution. But taking the, some of the words that have been previously said very wisely by the previous speakers, along this uh, road of uh, trying to contribute more to CTAP, that is really our purpose, we have found that uh, there are many key points that a research institution by itself cannot cover. Eh? And this is important. It is really true that uh, the relevance of public research is critical. Eh? In, in our case, in our country, we had, I think, the best experts in many research fields that provided solutions to many, many um, problems of the pandemic. And not only this, they also give confidence to our society that we were understanding what was happening and that eventually we will be managing to find the solutions. We know that this is a, at the end a global effort, but it's a global effort that in, in each country, uh, this requires a strong support of public research as it happens in Spain, and we are very proud of it. And then it's sharing technology, okay? And you have said already that this is very important that CITAP also includes sharing technology. We have the, 
the lack, let's say, but it's not really the lack. Eh? It's the Immunostep, the company that licensed our serological test, it was a spin off company of a university. And we really work together. And, and of course, the technology support when this ETAP solution is being um, uh, um, implemented in other countries, it's important that we have this access and this sharing of technology. Then another point very important that has also been mentioned by, I think, by, by Felipe is the regulatory issues and the how to manage with clinical trials. In this case, for us, it was really relatively straightforward because it was a radical test and we had a very close contact with a very good hospital. There are many good public hospitals in Spain. We are also very proud of this and this worked very, very well. But uh, these clinical trials and the regulatory uh, part are really hard for, for us, eh, for public research institutions, and we need more help. It has been said, and I think it's very important, that the establishment of a network of capacity, I would say even a network of knowledge and capacity, is required. But we have found in our discussion with private companies, of course, it's completely different than the what we find here in CTAP, eh? when we do discuss with private companies on the future, and you need private companies to find the best solutions for some of our solutions for our products or potential products. The agreements are much more difficult. Of course, you enter into not only confidentiality, uh, third party agreements is really complex for us. So when you realize that you are trying to address a global problem that has so much impact uh, in our world, we have to solve this, eh? even in the research uh, area where we have quite good networks of collaboration. And on the pandemic period, it was very hard to, to know how to proceed to make uh, larger and more ambitious projects. And it is the case yet today. Eh? There are not so many ambitious projects at research level that we have in other areas like, let's say, energy or environmental issues. And for the, the pandemic, we yet don't have such a strong networks. And we need them because we know there will be more pandemias. In fact, our global network within CSIC uh, is uh, working well with the help of the recovery and resilience funds in, in Europe. But we need really to establish, uh, let's say, a more stable network. Eh? And here you play a key role. Eh? You, have, uh, you are the ones that really trigger us to to go and say, it's not just that scientists are doing something, they, well, they are research, but it has an impact and it has to get to the society. This is very important for us also to have your support. And I think that's all that I wanted to say. Uh, we are very grateful to all the people that has uh, collaborated to make this real. And for our country, for our institution, and for our researchers, it, was, it is a privilege to contribute to this solidarity effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Marco. It, uh, it's very interesting uh, to hear. Um, we are, you were actually uh, very much on time as well. Um, I was wondering if Irene wants to go uh, next to explain a bit from the Spanish situation, uh, or uh, I don't know I, if you are if you're there, Irene. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Here I am. Thank you. Thank you, Ella, and um, uh, thank you very much, everybody and the organizers for inviting the Salud por Derecho. And um, well, as you, uh, as you know, my organization has been uh, committed to CTAP from the very beginning. And it has been one of the main policy asks uh, since uh, May 220 until officially Spain joined it, this initiative in the June 2020. Um, I actually think that uh, in the case of um, of Spain to and, and and to reply to the question why uh, Spain actually took uh, active this actively this this step, I believe that here conflate uh, a couple of issues. First, uh, there was a political will and uh, by the government and commitment with uh, global health and uh, the role of Spain taking clear the steps to overcome barriers on access to vaccines and treatments. 
And then the, the Spanish government has uh, shown such commit such commit commitment not only joining CITAP, but also supporting the trips vaccine waiver, which has been also very active on on on, on that. And then the second place, um, we as a civil society, we've been campaigning towards public interest on public care and defunding since 2017 very strongly, getting on board different groups and a, var and a variety of stakeholders, not only um, civil society groups, but also health professionals, uh, scientists and uh, decision makers. So at that time, I started a dialogue with the centers, the transport officers and, uh, and uh, decision makers seeking, seeking to engage them in access provisions when their own defunding is, is, is undertaken. I would say um, the floor was very much opened and, uh, and the topic in the agenda when the pandemic crisis arrived, and uh, with the great budgets assigned to R&D on COVID-19, we had that opportunity to say, okay, now is, not, now is the moment when um, we can uh, indeed show that, uh, that, that, that we can make a difference as a country, not only the research, the research centers, but also, but, but also the government. Since then, we have tried to engage the government in many processes during the last two years, uh, especially on sharing public care funding IP. The result has been their extensive support to this topic in, uh, in a couple of strategic documents, which actually has become a priority, but also informing the Congress uh, on the great importance of taking an active role on this issue. So, I would say that uh, now Spain's active role with CTAP, I think is recognized internally and externally, which is accompanied by the great step taken by the CIC, as Jesus Marco just presented. Shown leadership as a country, but also solidarity. So both facts, I think that are good reasons to engage more with CTAP and to encourage other countries showing that this decision was a very wise and responsible decision in a moment that was definitely um, needed a strong commitment and, uh, and also a fair policy worth of, of, of engagement. So uh, I think that, that, that this, these two variants, the political will, but also the, the work done during the last uh, four or five years I think that created the atmosphere and the ecosystem that uh, that we had, and uh, to 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 take a step forward and uh, and uh, and to show the leadership on on on, on this. So uh, so this, this 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 would be my this would be my my reply to your questions and uh, and open to to more older to the to the audience. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Irene Bernal from Salud por Derecho. It's very interesting to hear how, how you did this in the last years and how you made use of the, the atmosphere, the political uh, uh, atmosphere to, to be able to achieve this um, in, in Spain. I think a lot of other European countries can learn from this. Uh, our next speaker is um, uh, Mark van Passel, the Senior Policy Advisor, Global Health Security at the Dutch Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sport. He will respond from the Dutch government perspective on the use of CTIP and future pandemic response. I have the following question for you, Mr. van Passel. How can the pandemic treaty take care of equity and equitable access? Thank you very much, Ella. And uh, thank you very much for gives me the opportunity to well, mostly listen here to all these interesting speakers. Um, I, I think I'm just taking much more away than I can actually bring. Um, my name is Mark from Bussel. I work at the Ministry of Health, Welfare and Sport at the Director of International Affairs. And um, the international part of the Ministry of Health is of course always looking over the borders to see how things are going. I started working there at early 2000 with a different agenda, but of course, um, just like everybody else, the world was changed slightly, um, not, uh, not uh, very well into 2020. Um, we did learn a lot. I think that uh, if I take a step forward from 2020 to the end of 2021, when then there was a, a World Health Assembly, only this second special session, there was a collective, collective response and a, a decision that was taken um, to initiate a 
the negotiation process and intergovernmental negotiating body to get to a pandemic treaty because I think that um, at that time uh, the WHO Director General stated that I have to look them up. Comprehensive, coordinated, and effective were not the three words that would be used in the global response to the COVID outbreak. And we should be able to do better. We should be able to utilize the multilateral system better. We should be able to cooperate better. We should have solidarity much more at the center of the way that we um, deal with such pervasive health crises. Um, I think that uh, just to give a little bit of a background, drop to the, the pandemic treaty where we're not there yet, of course, but um, there was a call from different country, heads of state, heads of uh, heads of government um, early in 2021 to uh, uh, come up with a, an, a, a legally binding instrument. And Netherlands, and I think Costa Rica and Chile and Spain were all part of that as well. It's not, it's, I, I guess it's not surprising to meet my uh, uh, colleagues from different countries here as well. Um, we all thought that it would be really good to have a treaty to ensure that the global health architecture would be, well, for these three words, to be more comprehensive, to be better coordinated and be much more effective. Um, it took some time before the statement came out from these world leaders to the decision at the World Health Assembly, but here we are. So the the, the decision last December said that there would be an intergovernmental negotiating body. I'm not here to give you a lecture about the IAB per se, but basically the Netherlands is one of the co-chairs, one of the six chairs and one of the two co-chairs who is um, trying to steer this whole process towards 2024, which sounds so far away, but we're halfway there considering the pandemic, um, to ensure that there is there is something that we can offer the world and, and ensure that there is a better response. Um, a better uh, use of the global health architecture. This is not the only work stream that's currently ongoing at the WHO. There's of course the working group on pandemic preparedness and response that deals with all of the different recommendations that the world, um, the, the WHO received from the international or the independent panel for pandemic preparedness and response that also reflected on CTAP, the functioning of the international health regulations, which is of course already from 2005 and next week at the WHA, there's, um, uh, proposals or a proposal to see how we can improve the uh, IHR. But considering that we're in a pandemic and considering that the world pandemic word pandemic doesn't occur in the IHR, that's one of the reasons why a pandemic instrument should actually uh, um, uh, take place. Um, all of these panels together have, of course, mentioned that there's uh, uh, not a really good effective response globally against the pandemic. And if we've learned something that we should not only cooperate better, but also on a, on a basis of, as a cross-cutting theme of equity. So that brings me all the way to the way that the intergovernmental negotiating body started just before March 1st, it's only a couple of months ago, um, towards uh, August 1st, which is the other date that's explicit in the decision at the WHA special session, where a working draft should be presented. We're not there yet, we've just finished um, collecting all of the recommendations, all of the ideas, all of the suggestions, all of the uh, strategies and, and, and visions of the different um, non-state actors that have been involved, but also many member countries. This will be presented between 6th and 8th of June at the resume session of the IMB. And unfortunately, since we're still in the collecting phase, I, I can't say that much about it, except that the response has been overwhelming um, and it's been uh, there's a really large buy-in from the uh, from both countries and non-state actors. And I'm not sure to what extent uh, uh, participants or, or other speakers here have been involved in, in giving input. There were, of course, public hearings that you can actually still see at the WHA, WHO website. Uh, but there's also uh, written responses that came in, also a, a lot of those. And there's... Um, a not a survey but a digital platform that was uh, presented that has closed in the meantime and i think that for the part of uh, for this theme for ctap the 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 topic of equity is actually a really important one in to able to ensure that um, um solidarity or equity is really high on the agenda for a pandemic instrument i'd just like to highlight a couple of um uh 
well, of course, the, the definition of WHO for equity, WHO has defined equity as the absence of unfair, avoidable or remediable differences among groups of people, whether those groups are defined socially, economically, demographically, geographically, or by other stratifiers. Um, and health is a fundamental human right. Health equity is achieved when everyone can attain their full potential or of health and well-being. Um, on these, on the part of equity, um, I realize that there is a couple of substantive elements that have been proposed and that come from all of these panels that have been presented at the WHA 74, from the Independent Panel for Preparedness and Response, from the IHR Review Committee. And some of these really link very well to CTEP, access to life-saving, scalable and safe clinical care, uh, including mental health care. That's one of the first one that may not be as, as um, uh, linked to CTEP, but access to technology and know-how is, or affordability of pandemic response products, including medical countermeasures. These are uh, proposed uh, substantive elements that have come from all of these panels and that, sh that are put forward um, uh, by the uh, intergovernmental negotiating body to be considered as elements for an pandemic instrument. Um, I think that we have to wait a little bit longer to the resumed session of the INB in June to be able to see the full scope and the breadth of what all of the countries and stakeholders have presented as these should be parts of a pandemic instrument. But considering that equity is not only a cross-cutting theme now in the WHA, WHO proposed global health architecture, or I think it's called HEPR now, but also it's, it's, an, it's an integral part of the, um, um, of the, the, the intergovernmental negotiating body process. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the developments of all of these, um, of, of, of CTEP and how um, solidarity, uh, cooperation, and especially coordination can actually be much more expediated um, in, in the future when next pandemics will occur. Because slowness is not anything from this time anymore. We can, I, I'm pretty sure that we can do better. And I do hope that both the pandemic treaty or the, the initiative of CTAP will uh, be able to expedite responses when the next wave hits. Basically, that's that. I'd like to leave it there, but I really like to invite people to also ask questions, um, and I'll stay on until the end, of course, if there's any questions. I'm sorry that I can't go into much detail of the 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 answers or the the responses from the uh, IMB process. They have not been fully analyzed yet. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Passel. It sounds like an invitation to include a similar mechanism as CTEP in the pandemic treaty, but this is uh, at least some of uh, uh, what our organizations are aiming for, of course. Uh, there is a question in the chat for Mark, considering that Netherlands supposed interest in making these medicines equitable, accessible, how would you explain the contrasting position of the Netherlands in the WTO and their unwillingness support to the original TRIPS waiver? You're on mute uh, still. It's great to have these warnings on the screen. Um, I did anticipate that I'd be here either with the hat of the INB, of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Body, or from the hat of the Netherlands. And I know that I've been um, introduced as Mark van Passel from the Ministry of Health. I, uh, I I know, so let's see how I can, can I best answer this without going out of line. Um, the good part is that the the pandemic treaty is not a Ministry of Health issue uh, and, and pandemic instruments, of course, we've seen how the pandemic has affected the uh, entirety of a country, of different countries, uh, the how it's increased inequality between countries and within a country. Um, the whole purpose and aim of a pandemic instrument is to uh, not have something that just resides at the Ministry of Health, but it should have a much more interdepartmental or, or multi-sectoral, no, what's that? that, there's a better word for that, uh, whole of government, there's the one, whole of government approach. That means that there's also um, a large outreach between or connectivity now between uh, departments. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that that is, that is currently happening, also in the light of the recent advice that the Netherlands has received on a global health strategy. So this is all very much in flux. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I know this is not really the answer that you're looking for, um, but um, I, but that, that's also something that I can't answer here 
um, from the perspective that I'm actually speaking now. I'm sorry about that. No, thank you very much. It, it, it makes complete sense, uh, Mr. Van Passen also. Uh, we do know that the Netherlands is uh, supportive of a partial uh, TRIPS waiver, by the way, in, in line with the US position. Um, now we will listen to one of the co-organizers of this event, Mr. James Love, Director of Knowledge Ecology International. I have the following question for you, Mr. Love. How important is the NIH agreement with CTEP and the MPP? And can you tell us about what's next? Thank you very much. Um, well, for, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, I, I was involved uh, as, as so, so some of the other speakers here uh, in the origins or the initial proposal on the on the CTAP. And what we what we liked about it was the the ambition, and in particular, it was uh, it was proposed to be a global pool of know how. Uh, intellectual property rights, access to uh, uh, cell lines, all the things you might need to manufacture, produce, uh, and sell countermeasures uh, defined broadly uh, as, as Roman Mackay uh, mentioned in his presentation. Uh, it was supposed to be transparent and, um, and it, you know, it was the, these, the combination that it would be global, there'd be a lot of transparency and it would cover all technologies seem completely appropriate in a, in a thing that affected the whole world in such a dramatic way and where there was obviously uh, challenges in terms of in terms of scaling production of everything. That said, uh, I think over the course of the last couple of years, uh, we've been disappointed in the progress. Uh, there are, you know, it's certainly in the area of vaccines or therapeutics, uh, th th there are no products that have come out of CTAP at all. Uh, there has been no, uh, a, a, as yet, there's no um, products that are licensed to, to CTAP that, uh, that you know, are the, in the same way, for example, that um, uh, the medicines patent pool has announced two licenses in the, are, 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 are a couple of licenses in the therapeutics area um, that are uh, not global, but uh, they are associated with a, a real scale up of, of production and, and expansion of access. So, uh, uh, well, I, I, I think that uh, the, the, the speaker from the Netherlands was mentioning that in the course of the pandemic response, they were reflecting and saying that it was not like a shining moment for the global health community. I mean, I'm not talking about CTAP, I'm talking about everything. Uh, and the discussion to launch a negotiation on a, on a pandemic treaty it was, it was part of recognition that the current system just wasn't satisfactory. So they're, they're able to speak candidly about uh, not just you know, happy talk about the, the positives, but also to sort of examine some of the failures. And I think in the, in the area of CTAP, it's important to, to ask the questions of why it, you know, it's, it's been slow uh, so far and why it didn't really meet the challenge uh, in 2021, for example, uh, or even the first half of this year. Uh, I, I think one thing that uh, is important is it, it was a non-exclusive licensing of know-how um, cell lines and, and IP uh, was, you know, at the center of what the CTAP was at. And very early in the pandemic, um, uh, Bill Gates came out and really tried to push people away from open licensing, particularly initially with the AstraZeneca vaccine, where he tried to flip the position that had been announced by Oxford University from going non-exclusive to going exclusively with AstraZeneca. And I think he also had conversations with CEOs of companies to sort of push them in the idea of not to panic and to sort of stick with this sort of traditional uh, exclusivity model. Uh, uh, there was also a lot of uh, uh, national security hoarding of, 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 of countermeasures and, and nationalism that took place in 2020, I think stimulated initially probably by uh, Donald Trump trying to buy cure back out of Germany and then it just sort of cascaded across the board. So even though there was an early, like let's make this global public goods conversation in the spring of 2020, uh, in a very short amount of time, it was sort of a hunger games as it came to uh, you know, uh, uh, things. And then it eventually began to look very much like a massive uh, commercial opportunities. Now there's a lot of money uh, being spent right now. So in a way the, the um, the money it would, it would have taken to make things a global goods was really there if you, if you looked at it 
in that sense. Uh, I think that the, um, well, Moderna reported in 2021, last year, having made $18 billion with the sales of its vaccine, Pfizer reported $36.7 billion in sales from last year, which has just shattered every conceivable record that could be for any kind of a pharmaceutical or vaccine product in the history of the planet. Johnson & Johnson's product, which was not considered that successful, itself reported $2.4 billion in sales. AstraZeneca, also not considered to be uh, supposedly operating on a nonprofit basis, reported uh, uh, $3.9 billion in sales last year. So a lot of money was spent. And I haven't even talked about the, uh, some of the other leading vaccines like the, uh, from China and, and Russia. A lot of money was spent. Um, and there were a lot of subsidies that were given to companies in, in terms of the, uh, in, 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 in terms of the um, uh, initial development. Uh, you, you had, in the, in the case of Pfizer, you had the German government and you had the EU de-risking uh, the early development of the vaccine. In the case of Moderna, you had the U.S. government paying for everything. In the case of, of Johnson & Johnson, uh, you had very, very big um, risk sharing and, 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 and direct subsidies, the R&D, same thing with AstraZeneca. So you had a huge government involvement. What you didn't have were the, the people funding the vaccine R&D or the procurement using the leverage of all the public sector money that was spent and all the numbers I talked about was almost exclusively government money in terms of the sales into any obligations to openly license uh, technologies. Uh, so this was a, a great opportunity. It, it, was, it was both governments and it was also uh, uh, institutions like CEPI, uh, the Gates Foundation or the Wellcome Trust or other uh, charities that were also involved in were influential at that time, and also uh, did not go down this route. I think also the, the WHO deserves, um, uh, should be, reflect something on some of the early things. It appeared to us that the WHO was reluctant to take upstream technologies and was putting pressure on people that had actually approached the WHO or the negotiations to only Look to license in things that were already had re, had had become products and reached the market. It had stringent regulatory uh, approval and had very expensive and massive investments made in clinical trials to provide data. And that really was a uh, uh, a thing that made it difficult for some of the offerings that were made to the WHO um, to to be included in CTAP. And I think there was a, a mixed messy a, a mixture. And I think unfortunately between the role. Of the WHO as a regulator and providing pre-qualification -qual pre uh, endorsements of products as being safe and effective, and the role of CTAP in trying to corral and get access uh, to uh, uh, patents and uh, contracts and know-how and, and, and other types of uh, intellectual property. So uh, I, I think that the NIH contract is, was pretty important because it, it, it is a big funder uh, that, that, that was involved. Uh, it was upstream technologies. Uh, so these two things that kind of hadn't really manifested themselves being in the vaccine space did happen, uh, as well as in the therapeutic space with, uh, with the NIH thing. It, uh, um, uh, the fact that the president of the United States was involved in making the announcement, I think you'd have to give a lot of credit to Secretary Becerra in making this happen. He seemed to really be the person that was pushing this. Um, uh, that said, I think uh, within the NIH, there's no commitment at this point to licensing uh, things. And I think Burke Baker asked a question earlier about the uh, Department of Defense vaccine that's under production. The U.S. government is not committed to licensing things that are where, where the perception in the U.S. government is exclusive and is important for the commercialization of something. They, what they have licensed are things that they would consider uh, 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 things that they would normally do on a not on a non-exclusive basis, and so we we really haven't quite passed the threshold. I think I'm supposed to not talk forever here, so I'm going to try and um, focus a bit on the the issue of incentives um, that are related to how you might things uh, make things work better uh, in the future. One is there should be an agreement among member states. And this will be something I think, I believe, and I certainly hope will be discussed in the context of the pandemic treaty negotiations, an agreement of members to either share with CTAP or some similar entity, 
the the uh, the know-how and the intellectual property rights in publicly funded countermeasures for pandemics going forward, um, either for the whole world, which would be a unilateral decision, and I think it's feasible if you have enough buy-in, or at a very minimum and kind of a share and share alike uh, uh, mechanism, so that the countries that commit to sharing rights in government-funded uh, um, uh, R and D in this area, with at a very minimum, sh uh, uh, share with other countries that make similar commitments, at least within the uh, uh, the more profitable and high-income markets. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the regulatory path. One of the things that I think was important for uh, here was that the, the game-changing countermeasures that came out early were the vaccines, not really the therapeutics. There were therapeutics in 2020 that were kind of out there, but they weren't really considered to be that uh, significantly useful. The vaccines seem to be a really, you know, the big surprise and the big dramatic development in 2020. The regulatory pathway for vaccines is very, very challenging, it's more so than small molecules. So had small molecules, therapeutics had been the leading thing, I think it would have been easier to push on the open licensing of those things. Uh, on vaccines, the counter argument was that even if you had the IP, if you didn't have the know-how or uh, uh, really uh, the other things that it takes to get regulatory approval for a vaccine, it would not have made a difference. That was the argument that was being made by the vaccine manufacturers at the time. Now, I think that will be sorted out going forward. Uh, hopefully they'll take a harder look at how they can make that things better. But, um, uh, can, I, can I ask you to round up? There's also one uh, uh, question in the chat for you. I, I would like to. Okay, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just wind up on the incentive side. It, uh, it, it, if the government's going forward, would, would not just defer to the companies to have their own trials to provide the safety and efficacy information and have the public sector provide more independent head to head trials, I think it would improve public confidence in the safety and efficacy information if it was done independently. And it would be more pro-competitive if you did more head-to-head -head trials. And also you could take, you could give a priority for funding for things that were licensed openly. So if you had an open source vaccine, like for example, the Baylor vaccine, or if another company had offered to openly license, that could give them a leg up in terms of getting public funding in terms of some of the regulatory pathway issues. That would be a, a significant thing. Uh, that the, 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 the could make a difference. And, and, and if you weren't sure if it would be warranted, you could at a very minimum have a trigger that said if there's a supply, access, inequalities, or other failures in the market, that you could you could exercise this trigger. And, and the question in the chat is... Uh, early on, CTAP seemed to focus on primarily uh, on lining up endorsements to the solidarity call to action rather than actively and specifically approaching rights holders to license their rights into CTIP. I'm curious if there has been reflection on the passivity of this early strategy and the re repercussions it may have had in terms of timing of the licenses that did eventually get successfully negotiated. I, I, I think that the, uh, I, I would, I, I would, on the first part about trying to line up the sponsors, I think it, would, it was important to line up political support for the initiative to get companies that held certain IP to, to participate. That really did not happen. I mean, the United States government clearly was not uh, doing anything to support it. Trump was not really on board. And that was uh, pretty obvious. And I, I, I think you did not see a very, very deep uh, engagement in Europe, uh, for example. I mean, you did some countries and certainly certainly Spain and uh, was, was, was really a, a bright spot and, and the Netherlands were a bright spot, but there was really a lot of problems in Europe as well uh, <clears throat> or Canada. So I think that, I think uh, uh, they had to try and get, get sponsors. But in terms of reaching out, I, I would agree that more could have been done to make concrete ask. What we, what we, we thought should have been have is, is for COVAX, and for Gavi and for um, CEPI and, and different organizations, it was, it was a bit more perhaps uh, public, public engagement and, and information about what was going on. There was CTAP. CTAP was almost a secret because there were not WHO press conference and press briefings exclusively for CTAP. And they weren't really using the bully puppet uh, 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 to, to reach out to, to, to key, key enters and pressure them to, uh, to engage. And that really did not happen. Okay, thank you. There's one other question. What is the danger of integrating the current model promoted by Gates into the WHO treaty accord? 
For example, maintaining pharma monopoly and COVAX as a success in ignoring pooled mechanisms like CTIP. This is also a question I think Mr. Van Passel uh, was interested in answering, if I'm correct, but please go ahead, James. Well, I, 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 I don't think you can talk about what happened in the pandemic, particularly the first, the first 18 months of the pandemic, without talking about the role of Bill Gates personally and the Gates Foundation. And he, he, he really, and you can see it even in his recent book, I mean, he's been very clear about the fact that he believes that exclusivity is essential going forward and he's committed to it and it's really ideological even in the face of absolute inability to meet demand uh he was really defending the idea that you, you know that, that of exclusivity and he never really uh, acknowledged that that was really a problem so i think that i think that this is something people have to confront now if you're not going to have exclusivity i think uh, roma micaiah from costa rica was correct i think you have to think about what the incentives are if exclusivity is not the incentive. The fact that you spent $36.5 billion with one company last year, Pfizer, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and almost that much with the other suppliers of vaccines last year indicates that you can afford to, to finance incentives for, uh, uh, for te technology transfer buyouts or uh, 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 monetary rewards for people that openly license their products because uh, there's really actually a lot of money in the system and the failure to go down that road and, and design incentives specifically designed to enhance the, the, uh, uh, the opening up of the IP and the know-how, I, I think it's been a, a big policy failure. Thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, Mr. Van Passel, are you interested in, in uh, responding to this question as well? Well, yes, very briefly. So it's, it's difficult to foresee how you would integrate the current model uh, into a WHO treaty accord. Currently, there's there's no structure yet, there's no framework yet, there's no provision selected yet that has to be done in July. So it's it's uh, currently there's a collection phase, and I'm pretty sure that the Bill Gates Foundation, Bill and the Gates Foundation, have also been asked for for input, and I think they also did that in the public hearings. So um, it'll <laughs> it sounds horrible. It'll end up on the big heap, and after that, some structure will be carved out. Um, f um, towards the uh, treaty and accord, but, but currently it's it's difficult to say how you would integrate something into something that doesn't exist yet. You should definitely weigh it in. Um, I, I, you you could have an, an obligation of member states uh, to to put provisions and funding contracts for R and D related to um, uh, future pandemics. Um, so there's a path to expanding access to the know-how and the IP, particularly if you can point to uh, shortages and inequality and things that are kind of, could be resolved with better approaches on scale up. Okay, thank you very much both. I would like to give the floor to uh, our final speaker, Mrs. Ellen Voon, who is also one of the co-organizers. Co uh, for, for concluding remarks to, to the event, but uh, also to go deeper into the role of the EU. Because after hearing so much interesting information, um, I think uh, you can uh, give feedback of, of, of a reflection of what you've heard, uh, Ellen, the floor is yours. Yeah, th thank, thank you very much, Ella. I, um, therefore, I did not prepare any, any presentation ahead of time, but I would like to just give some reflections on what, what, I, what I heard. Um, first of all, thank you all for taking part in this, because this was, again, really very interesting, uh, very, very interesting discussion. And I would like to start with congratulating Spain uh, for having been the first, um, the, the, the first uh, licensor to CTAP. But also Costa Rica, because without Costa Rica and its leadership, uh, CTAP would not uh, would not have happened. Um, also, a congratulation to the WHO and the Medicines Patent Pool for their recent agreements with the, with the NIH, because that is a very significant, even though the, 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 the medical significance of the technologies as such today is hard to judge. Uh, what cannot be ignored is the political significance of the move by President Biden to um, to work with, uh, with, with CTAP. Um, but we also have to recognize that for two and a half years into the pandemic, 
and we have not seen the vaccine manufacturers that actually have vaccines on the market come forward to, to work with the initiative. And as uh, Mr. Makaya said, it is a voluntary um, mechanism and that um, that should have its attractions for, for those that are wary of giving up their, uh, their IP. But uh, it is also, of course, the weakness because there are the, 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 and there is a, a lack of, uh, so there's a lack of sticks and there's uh, the carrots are, um, were certainly there, but not used in the right way as James Love also, um, also explained. The, 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 the United States has been, an enormous funder of these vaccines. Uh, J Jamie listed some of the um, some of the um, the turnover in vaccine sales, um, but the United States has also directly financed the development, and, and so has the EU to a certain ex uh, extent. Uh, the the development of the vaccines and the Moderna vaccine, for example, is, is almost entirely a U.S. government. Uh, funded and Moderna is also one of the staunchest refusers of working with uh, initiatives such as CETA, but for example, also the mRNA hub in, um, in South Africa. So I was pleased to hear from the WHO that they are doing more work on model provisions in funding agreements, because if you look at the last two and a half years, the real big missed opportunity was, of course, the moment when the billions were being handed over for the development of these vaccines, the billions for procurement, for, for, for market commitments, all of those went out of the door without the strings attached, that the knowledge that would be developed with that financing would be shared with the world, uh, with the world that's at large. So we saw a huge disconnect between the promise of pandemic countermeasures needing to be global public goods and the lack of political uh, political action to actually make that happen. The global leaders, and that includes in particular the, the leadership of the European Union and the European Commission, made beautiful statements, but they acted as if saying these things publicly would also make it happen. These vaccines will be our common good. No one will own these vaccines. That sounded beautifully, but if you don't take political action, it is simply not not going to uh, not going to happen. So so again, to James' point, uh, getting countries to endorse and support CTAP was a very important uh, move, um, I believe. But um, a lot more um, a lot more needs to needs to happen. And here, I would like to say a few words about the pandemic treaty negotiations because what we what needs to happen is the establishment of a global norm that if you hold the IP and the know-how for the production the provision of pandemic countermeasures, you share those. That is not something that you can appropriate. That is something that needs to be shared with the, with the world at large through mechanisms such as the medicines patent pool or, uh, or CTAP. And I think it's important that that norm is codified, that the pandemic treaty regulates that head on. Um, with a number of the organizations here present, we held, this is more than a year ago, I think, perhaps even longer, a working group to, um, to, to design what would be the most important provisions on intellectual property that the pandemic treaty should, um, sh should encompass. And um, Mark, I, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to share those with you. We've published them in various shapes and forms, but we're working also on a, on a publication. But the draft of that, I can certainly share, um, share with you. A large group of experts in this field have worked, um, have worked with that. So I think that the pandemic treaty is a, a very important uh, opportunity, but it will require the political will. There, of course, if we now look at what has happened at the World Trade Organization on the discussions on access to vaccines, pandemic, pandemic countermeasures as a whole aren't even on the agenda, agenda it is only vaccines. That is, a, that is a rather sad state of affairs. The European Union has played a, a, a very, um, uh, and I'm using a kind word here, and very unhelpful, uh, unhelpful uh, uh, role in that. And uh, my personal view is that um, the WTO membership should go back to the drawing board and design something much more ambitious. I thought this, even the original TRIPS waiver, which was seen by many as, as going overboard, was way too modest and way too 
to 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 limit it to offer uh, any any serious uh, 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 meaningful uh, solution. Something else needs to be put in place, and perhaps uh, as as we've commented on earlier, um, the, the the people concerned with public health and the people concerned with trade issues, perhaps it would be much better to put them all in one room uh, instead of these these fora negotiating more or less at the same time in Geneva in different uh, in different cor corners of the of the city. So. Um, the uh, yeah, I, I see the pandemic treaty as an opportunity to get a few things right. It won't have much meaning for the current pandemic, but there are many lessons that have been learned. As Mark also pointed out, uh, the, the various reports that have have been have been been published in the meantime, many less lessons that have been learned from this pandemic. And if that does not translate into better uh, global rules, we will be faced with an enormous missed opportunity, but also be faced with the same level of inequity that we've seen in the last two years. Over to you, Ella. Thank you, Ellen. There's one question in the chat for you from Brooke Baker. Uh, the sticks that Ellen describes can consist of the waiver more broadly and compulsory licenses more narrowly, including recently proposed compulsory licenses on trade secrets. Shouldn't we simultaneously be pushing for involuntary access as well as voluntary, since the voluntary licenses almost always exclude upper middle income countries where industries see potential for profiteering. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think Brooke is right. I think the involuntary measures are very important. I would like to see countries uh, use them uh, when necessary. Uh, with more forcefulness than, than what we have seen. Uh, we are currently working on the update of our TRIPS flexibilities database, where since 2001, we, we've documented all the cases where countries have used involuntary measures to gain access to essential medicines. And it's interesting that there are there is the, the recent activity has been almost exclusively in the field of COVID-19, but countries actually have a lot of um, a lot of possibilities under international trade law, but also under their own domestic uh, uh, legislation derived from that, to take involuntary measures that they do not exploit uh, enough when when needed. One important feature, for example, and you do see now um, uh, initiatives, particularly in the Latin American countries, as Brooke pointed out, those are often the countries excluded from voluntary licenses, including the licenses from the medicines patent pool. But what the medicines patent pool licenses do secure, do safeguard, is the ability of their sub-licensees, so their, the generic manufacturers, to supply the medicines that they can produce with those voluntary licenses to countries that have issued compulsory licenses. So in fact, that could close the loop. And that will, again, require uh, the political will to make use of these mechanisms and, and, and political action. We do not see enough of that. Thank you. Thank you. There's one other question for you, Ellen, from Andreas Wolf. Would the WTO accept that a pandemic treaty regulates on IP provisions if they are not part of the negotiations, Ellen? Well, the, the WTO is, is of course, its is of course its membership. This is about formulating norms, and what we have often seen is, um, if you look at some of the good norms that have been developed in the WTO, look at the DOA Declaration on Trips and Public Health in 2001, the discussions about that did not start at the WTO. The discussions about that started at the World Health Organization and then rolled over to the WTO when countries said, okay, these are all great ideas and we all agree that this needs to happen, but it is actually very difficult because there are a, a number of problems that need to be resolved at the WTO. So something like that uh, could happen. But if the collective membership, because at the end of the day, the members are the same, if at the WHO it, progress is made, that would have to have an effect at the WTO. What keeps me awake at night these days is if the WTO adopts in the coming week the wishy-washy non proposal that is on the table today and that that becomes the norm and get cut and pasted into pandemic treaty and mark it is your role to make sure on behalf of our government that that does not happen because that would be absolutely disastrous i think we need to collectively acknowledge that what is happening at the wto is below the bar and that we have to do a whole lot better in the public health forum 
at the at the WHO. Over. Thank you. One more question, one final question before we round up uh, the event. Uh, what measures would you recommend to encourage governments to take on the private sector to require the measures that you have been recommending? What would generate the political will to, of, of today resistant governments like Europe, as you mentioned, to do so? Well, we should perhaps change our voting behavior. That's, of course, that, 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 that usually has some effect on the, on the political will. So debates like this are incredibly important. But with regard to the, regulating the private sector, um, I think particularly at the, if you look at the European level, there, is, there are now plans or it is on, on its way. Um, HERA has been set up. So that is, that, is, that is a mechanism for stimulating innovation and research and development with lots of money. Those are the mechanisms that need to be used to also regulate the private sector. And as I said earlier, if you're spending billions, of which I'm a great proponent, let me be clear about that. I think this government financing on the development of the pandemic countermeasures have been absolutely fabulous, but don't do it the next time around without putting conditions on that funding, because that's where it went wrong. And I think that that will have, uh, that will have a very, uh, uh, that will have an effect also uh, on, on the industry because um, let's, let's, let's face it, at the end of the day, very few will pass up the kinds of uh, billions of, of financing that has been made, has been made available. Over. Okay, thank you very much, Ellen. After hearing so much interesting information, I would like to ask the different speakers if, they, if there are still some concluding final remarks uh, for them. So I'll go, go through the whole list and please keep it short, keep it to to a, a half a minute or so, one phrase, if you have a conclu concluding remark, especially around the question, how to unleash the potential of CTEP for future pandemic response. Mr. Makaya, do you have some final words? Yes, thank you very much. And it's been a, a, a tremendous uh, workshop and, and I've learned a lot from everyone. Um, I would just uh, highlight the need to streamline scientific collaboration by having this sort of uh, IP clearinghouse uh, that uh, allows for that, to improve the incentives for this collaboration and increase in supply, and to improve equity of access to the technologies that can make a difference. And I'd just like to end by saying that uh, it's not just solidarity, it's self-interest. Uh, all, everything that we're living today the dozens of trillions of dollars in economic damage and social damage started with one case. And so we're not out of it until everyone's out of it. So if, you know, looking back, if we could say, well, if we could put together $10 billion at the very beginning of this pandemic and squash it where it, uh, was, where it uh, started, that would sound like very generous and uh, a very extreme solidarity. But looking back at the trillions of dollars spent, it would be the most self-interested investment that we could do. And so uh, I think we need to keep that in mind. Yes, it's very true. Thank you very much for that contribution. Uh, Miss, Mrs. Duenas Loisa from the World Health Organization, do you have any final remarks to make? Yes, yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, please. thank you very much, Ella. Yeah, maybe just a just a few comments. One uh, that I, I forgot to mention that uh, in, in relation to the NIH uh, agreement to thank our um, technical advisory group in CTAP that has uh, recently uh, established and they review the license and they play a very important role in improving the content of the, of the license as well. So just uh, to mention that um, this um, multidisciplinary group is working very hard also in WHO, uh, in WHO CTAP. And then a comment that uh, in relation to what the representative from um, the Ministry of Health of Netherlands said as well, which I think it's, it's very, very important because there is a, a lot of 
link between uh, CTAP and, and in particular the principles included in the solidarity call to action with the different negotiations taking place in, in WHO. Uh, we saw it in the local production uh, resolution, for example, the transparency resolution, but also now on the INB, uh, as, as he mentioned. But we should also not, not forget that there is uh, in the agenda of this assembly the, ex the extension, the extension of the plan of action of the global strategy uh, on public health, innovation and intellectual property. And, and, um, and we know that this kind of mechanism, like the patent pools, come from the recommendations of the GSPOA. So that is also very important to mention. And finally, just a word on the, on the of course, CTAP can, uh, is a mechanism and uh, is a voluntary mechanism and it, it is uh, very important and it is an alternative, but it's definitely not the only uh, solution that, that member states have to promote access. So um, it needs to be seen as part of, of the solution to promote access. But, and that is why uh, WHO keeps reminding member states to use all the flexibilities they have in, in their hands for public health purposes. And we're closely following the discussions uh, on the TRIPS waiver um, as well. And we, we expressed our concerns about the current text to the WTO Secretariat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Duenis Loeza from the World Health Organization. Mr. Burone from the Medicines Patent Pool, do you have one takeaway? takeaway message, or can you keep it brief as well? Well, I'd, I'd like to be optimistic when in the final message, and I, I'd like to say that, um, you know, we can see the, the glass half empty, but we can also see it half full. And I think we have seen over the last six months a lot of things progressing in terms of the licensing, the tech transfer, the, the mRNA hub, uh, CTAP getting a bit more momentum, licensing of antivirals, etc. So we, we are seeing things moving in, in a direction that I think is very is very promising. So let's use that, let's use that momentum. Ultimately, to make convince people that this works, we're gonna to need to show results. That's what's gonna make the difference. Uh, you know, ideas can be really well conceived, but unless you have the results at the end of the day. So I think we need to focus on that, deliver on those things that we do have. And I think we can make a very strong case uh, for these kinds of initiatives um, going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bruno of the Medicines Patent Pool. Next is, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Marco of the CSIC, the Spanish Research Council. Do you have one uh, final remarks or on how to yes. unleash the potential of CTEP? Thank you. Yeah, my, my final remark is that this is a, a long way to go yet. And we have to be aware of this. The pandemic is not really over. Eh? We may be almost convinced that it is almost over in many occidental countries, but it is not over in the whole world. So we have to keep working and have in mind that this is a, a, a long term effort. Have this in mind. This is very important. Thank you very much to all of you and all the speakers and the attendants. Thanks. Thank you very much for your participation. Next is Mr. Van Passel of the Dutch government, the Dutch Ministry of Health. Would you like to make some final remarks? still or? Uh, um yeah I, I i i totally agree that it's still a long way to go and i think if we're on a really long way you shouldn't use sticks it's much easier to take a long road with carrots with you so i i i don't um i'm, I'm not gonna i'm not gonna claim that i, I made up this saying uh, but recently someone said it's really during the pandemic, we found out that compliance and accountability was really hard with the international health regulations, and that should be much more heavily invested in, or that should get much more attention. Um, someone else recently said in a meeting that it's much easier to work on the front end, to work with incentives, and not wait till there's a crisis and ensure and, and then force countries to do certain things. It's much. It, it would be so much better if we can ensure that on the front, just on the on the preparedness or the prevention side, there's many more um, incentives to keep on working with, because it's much more, in my opinion, a much more agreeable position to be in, to encourage people to do nice things with carrots instead of sticks. Thanks. Thank you. Mrs. Bernal, do you wish to make a final remark? Salud por derecha. Yeah, thank you very much, Ella. Um, I will just take from uh, what uh, Esteban just mentioned. We have many lessons learned, and uh, now is uh, we have uh, such a momentum to put in place access provisions in R&D funding contracts. We know what happened 
um, if we don't take uh, these steps um, very back and uh, from the very beginning. So uh, we have now the opportunity to, to change. We have learned, we have experiences. So uh, I think this is, is, is the moment to move forward on that. And indeed, it's still a long way, but we have learned and we know now what we have to do. So uh, there we go. That would be my, my remark. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Irene. Uh, Mr. James Love, do you have a final remark to round up this discussion? Thank you. Uh, uh, the, uh, trans the World Health Organization in 2019 passed a, adopted a, a resolution on transparency and that was pretty much ignored during the whole pandemic. I think that was probably due to the national security framing that evolved in, in the first part of 2019. 20, but it really is unfortunate because one thing that happens in a pandemic is everyone wants to know what's going on. And you also need to have public confidence. And some of the vaccine evidence is probably made worse by the feeling that there was not enough transparency. I'm hoping that in the pandemic treaty negotiation, there's a chapter on transparency. Uh, that puts some teeth into it, because I think it really uh, is important. Uh, on the intellectual property thing and the flexibility uh, that uh, uh, Brooke and Ellen and others have referred to, uh, one, one model we've encouraged people to look at in the pandemic treaty is the model of the Marrakesh Treaty for the Blind. In the Marrakesh Treaty for the Blind, they did not change uh, copyright treaties, but what they did is they looked at the existing flexibility and the existing treaties and they had a, man, a mandate that you had to implement those things for the benefit of blind people globally. And that has been one of the most successful treaties ever negotiated. It's been endorsed in the European Union by the United States, even by the Trump administration. It's been implemented and it dramatically changed the availability of accessible works for blind people from one end of the earth to the other. And uh, it's a different approach than what the WTO negotiations have done, which is a permissive lifting of rules. It's, a, it's an actual concrete mandate that you do certain things to ensure that there's equity. Uh, so I would, I would encourage the negotiators to look at that. On uh, the, the, I think the priority has to be public sector funding and designing of head-to-head -head trials. It's, it's not enough just to hand over a billion dollars here or a billion and a half dollars there to a vaccine company with no strings attached. Um, I, I think the government, if they're funding trials, they should also be running the trials and they should be designing the trials and they should be doing head-to-head -head trials. The, U, the NIH recently has an agreement with Moderna to do trials on about four or five different uh, 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 modifications of their vaccine. And, but you know, you know, you know, what they, they should be doing is comparing the Cuban vaccine, the, the, the various versions of the uh, Baylor vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine, that you know all the all the different vaccines against each other, particularly in the booster market right now for COVID, because right now uh, the booster market is where things are at, in in, in my opinion, and 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 essentially uh, uh, what we really have to know is how the different boosters in a mix and match scenario work work against each other, but having the government fund these could end up being very cost effective because then you can end up uh, um, with more confidence that you might, some, some of the lower cost uh, versions may be more durable uh, and, and certainly effective enough uh, for boosters in terms of severe illnesses uh, to be effective. And lastly, in addition to using the leverage and funding from R&D and procurement that has been discussed um, by Alan and, and, and other speakers, um, I think it's, I, I just wanna reiterate that it's important to delink the incentives from exclusivity Exclusive rights is the wrong incentive when there's a global health emergency that would benefit from decentralized efforts to scale production. Exclusivity is the opposite of what you want. You, you, want, you want to mobilize as many manufacturers as possible to scale manufacturing, and you don't want it all in one country, like what happened when India started limiting exports, for example, of vaccines that were produced. Um, and funded by COVAX. You want, you want really decentralized, scalable production. And so, but you, need, you also need incentives. And so it, to the extent that you, you need incentives, they have to be something other than exclusivity. And that means that it, it, it involves money. And, uh, uh, and, I, and, and, and uh, I think Roman Mackay made an early reference to that as well. 
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, James. Ellen, uh, can I give the final floor to you? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, Jamie just said um, you, you need money. I think it's also important to recognize that you need funders um, that are willing to take risks, that are willing to fund real change, not business as usual. There's enough of that around, a lot, perhaps even, even too much. But um, we also have to recognize, because we, we, we thanked a lot of people for what they've done to make the medicines patent pool and make CTAP happen, but we haven't mentioned Unitaid, which is one of those funders that is willing to fund activities and initiative that sort of go against the grain and make people uncomfortable. And um, without them, for example, the medicines patent pool would never have come off the ground. They were also the first to support CTAP. Um, and I just want to um, want to highlight that as a as an example. They can't they can't uh, they can't just re remain the only one doing that. Um, so this is also a plea for to other funders to become a bit more ambitious than what we've seen in in recent years. Thank you, Ella. Thank you very much, uh, Ellen Thun from Medicines Law and Policy. And with that, I would like to round up this event and thank you all for attending. Uh, if there are any questions left. Please reach out to WEMOS. Have a great day, have a great afternoon or evening, and let's continue this amazing work we're all doing. Thank you very much.